Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the inaugural webinar that's being hosted by Value Capture. I'm Mark Graben. I'm going to play the role of host, and I'm going to kick things off by covering a little bit of the logistics and um, handing things off um, to the rest of our group. Um, we are joined today by Mike Bundy. He's the CEO of Prisma Health Baptist and Baptist Park Ridge Hospitals. We're joined by Missy Danforth. She's the Vice President of Healthcare Ratings for the LeapFrog Group. And then we're also joined, and he's going to be our moderator for the main portion of the section, uh, Ken Siegel, the CEO of Value Capture. So I want to thank all of them for being here. I want to thank everyone for logging in and attending, and I will be back at the end um, to help moderate some of the final Q&A. Let me just tell you a little bit about Value Capture. Um, Value Capture provides trusted advisory support to health system leaders committed to producing perfect health with zero harm, weight, or waste for patients, team, enterprise, and community. Our mission is habitual excellence, which we believe starts with safety. We were founded in 2005, and Paul O'Neill Sr. served as our founding non-executive chairman until his passing last year. We've been privileged to partner with great safety leaders over the years, exemplified by our two guests today. Um, so with that, let me turn things over to Ken Siegel. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, and it is really my privilege to, to formally introduce our guests. You've heard that Missy Danforth is the Vice President of Healthcare Ratings at the LeapFrog Group, where she is a member of the senior leadership team, informing LeapFrog strategic direction, engaging experts and stakeholders, and analyzing program results to engage purchasers and consumers and drive safety and quality improvements across American healthcare. Um, she, bottom line, as Missy oversees LeapFrog's various measurement and public reporting activities, and this includes the LeapFrog Hospital Survey, the LeapFrog ASC Survey, the LeapFrog Hospital Safety Grade, and Emerging Rating Programs as well. So, uh, very significant figure in American safety, and a truly an expert one, a passionate one, and an effective one, and we're all grateful for LeapFrog's work. Um, and for Missy's key role in that work. We're excited to hear today uh, important information from Missy about the survey. Uh, and Missy will also be part of the Q&A session um, to help answer questions that may come up. Um, and Mike Bundy um, serves as the chief executive officer, as you heard, for both Baptist and Baptist Park Ridge Hospitals in Columbia, South Carolina. He assumed that role in February of 2019. So between 2019, February, and now, Mike uh, and his colleagues led one of their campuses to achieve LeapFrog top hospital status. Um, those of us at Value Capture, or those that have worked with Mike in the past, weren't surprised. Um, he has two decades of experience producing these kinds of results in healthcare. Um, he served previously as Senior VP and Chief Operating Officer at Cape Cod Healthcare. Um, he worked at Med Assets. He's worked outside healthcare shortly uh, for a period. And um, he, early in his career, held several operational leadership roles with the Wellmont Health System in Kingsport, Tennessee, where we had the privilege of supporting and partnering directly with Mike. Um, he also served eight years active duty as a commissioned infantry officer in the U.S. Army Rangers. So uh, there's a chance you may hear a story or two that ties back to uh, that foundational experience for Mike. Um, so uh, Mike and I will have sort of a uh, website fireside chat in a minute here, but uh, Missy is going to lead us off with uh, critical information about the survey. Missy? Thanks so much, Ken, and uh, good morning for most everyone. I see some familiar names on the participant list, so thanks for being here. Just a few uh, a few words about the Leapfrog Group. We are a national not-for-profit. We're actually headed, headquartered in Washington, D.C., but we've all been working remotely for the past year. We were founded by large uh, self-insured employers uh, shortly after the 1999 IOM report to Err is Human. Our founders were distressed um, by the amount of preventable harm occurring to their employees and their employees' families in hospitals. And so created the LeapFrog Group to drive change uh, through transparency. Um, and we have continued on uh, with their mission and vision for the past 20 years, just celebrating our 20 year anniversary. 
Uh, we continue to work to trigger giant leaps forward in the safety and quality of U.S. healthcare. And one of the most powerful ways we do that is by collecting data from hospitals and more recently ambulatory surgery centers and getting that data used by national and regional health plans, transparency vendors, consumers, and others to really help inform their decision making. Next slide. Our flagship program um, has been and really continues to be our annual hospital survey. This is a national survey that's free to all hospitals across the United States. It's open annually from April 1st to November 30th. And we collect data and score it and publicly report it on a free website. The measures on our hospital survey are nationally standardized and evidence-based, and like many organizations, we try to align with national organizations so you can use data that you may already have so that we can drive um, increased change through alignment. And so many of the measures on our survey are um, in use by the national quality, for, um, I'm sorry, are in use by the Joint Commission, such as our maternity care measures. Uh, which are part of the Joint Commission's perinatal care measure set um, by the CDC. All of our infection measures come directly from the CDC's NHSN program and from CMS. We know many hospitals are uh, investing resources and in participating in CMS's uh, mandatory quality and payment programs. And so where possible, we do try to align with CMS as well. Um, there's a link in this deck, which I'm sure Ken will be distributing that gives an overview of all of our measures that are used by other national organizations. But this is all to say that we um, are really trying to put an effort forth to throw the influence of our purchaser and employer community um, behind other national efforts so we can get improvement faster in these key areas of things like maternity care, infection prevention, um, and other areas. Next slide. The survey includes several different areas of hospital care um, where we focus on, and that includes things like medication safety and the use of CPOE. Adult and, complex, adult and pediatric complex surgeries where LeapFrog has worked with national experts to develop hospital and surgeon volume standards. Um, maternity care, which is probably our most popular set of metrics to the purchasers and employers that we work with and also consumers that visit our public reporting website. ICU physician staffing, which was one of the founding standards on our survey 20 years ago, first developed by Peter Pronovost and looks at uh, the use of board certified uh, intensivists to staff ICU units. Patient safety practices ranging from nursing care to hand hygiene and managing serious errors, which focuses on whether or not hospitals have a hospital wide policy for dealing with never events. And these are the serious reportable events that should never happen to everyone, like removal of the wrong limb or wrong site surgery. We also focus on pediatric care and most recently outpatient procedures. The survey was really designed to be a dashboard for purchasers and employers to use, but has really been transformed to an important resource for healthcare consumers and their families and caregivers. Um, and as I said, is used by many health plans um, and others across the country. Next slide. All of our survey results are publicly reported on a free website. So once hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers submit a voluntary survey to LeapFrog, their results are published. So you can search for your own hospital, um, hospitals in your market, surgery centers in your market. We think making survey results free um, to consumers and others is really critical in our continued drive towards increased transparency. Unlike some other national ratings organizations, none of our information is behind a paywall. You can download a hard copy of our survey today. All of our scoring algorithms are public and that all feeds into our ratings being public as well. So we've really prided ourselves and I think created a strong, long lasting, trusting relationship with the hospital community and now surgery centers. Um, by making all of our information uh, publicly available. Thanks, Ken. Missy, thanks so much. And, you know, as you speak and we all 
think back about how appreciative we are of LeapFrog's leadership and the transparency movement. I hope everybody hears the, the principles that are behind it, that we, all of us on this call and in the audience who are working so hard on things, you just recognize our fundamental and we appreciate your leadership. Um, so thank you. And we're glad we'll have you, have you here for Q&A uh, after as well, because I'm sure people on the call have some questions. Um, so Mike, um, turning to you, um, you know, uh, we, we start um, often, we've been privileged to support uh, healthcare leaders who want to anchor performance transformations in the pursuit of zero harm uh, as the anchor to achieving habitual excellence. And in that role, we're sort of jointly animated by the accomplishments, the spirit, uh, and the teachings of our executive chairman, Paul O'Neill, um, who's the former CEO of Alcoa, healthcare safety pioneer, U.S. Treasury Secretary. Um, when we got to work with you, Mike, a full 15 years ago now, um, the ideas and strategies and interaction between our groups, but also directly with Paul himself and yourself, was really kind of an explosion of force for excellence. Uh, and you brought a lot to the table yourself on that side of it. So let's just start our, our dialogue by talking about just a couple of the key teachings that Paul shared with both of us. The first was that safety for your teams as well as your patients is the best leading indicator for your business. So safety is the best leading indicator. Two, safety has to be a precondition to all other work. It is not a priority that we trade off against other priorities, including and especially perhaps in a crisis. We'll return to that theme in a minute. And then third, you know, the passionate belief that with leadership, everything is possible and without it, nothing is. And that really brings us to a central theme of this webinar and our work, which is that to achieve actual safety and do it sustainably, it has to be owned by the leaders of the enterprise, not as something that just the valued experts do, not something to be delegated, but all of us starting with me. And the reason is fairly obvious, right? It's leaders who are responsible, especially for things go wrong, gone wrong, we think, because they oversee the systems that support the people doing the work and their ability to do that work successfully. And of course, they set the tone in the example and the expectations for the culture. So Mike, turning to you, let's start before the crisis. When you came to Prisma, what did you do as a leader, together with your colleagues, of course, to establish the pursuit of zero harm as a precondition, if you will? What did you do as a leader? What systems did you put in place? Well, first, thanks for having me here today, Ken. And, and when I arrived at Prisma, I was just absolutely blessed to, to land in an organization um, already rooted in um, a relentless pursuit of perfection with an incredible medical staff and, and incredible teams on both Baptist and Park Ridge campus and across our health company. Um, but, but the first thing we really did as it relates to, to the learnings that we got when I first met you and, and had the privilege of working with Mr. O'Neill was the recognition and the socialization of what Mr. O'Neill taught us so very clearly. And that was the concept of pursuing the theoretical limits of process reliability. And then uh, the Prisma CEO, Mr. Marco Hallow, he reinforced that on his first, maybe his second day, and I'd never even spoken with him, uh, his second day on the ground in, in South Carolina. He challenged us with the relentless pursuit of perfection. That combined concept that has been transformed nationally uh, into the idea that zero, zero harm, zero outliers um, is, is possible. And then we began looking, you know, when you have a harm event and you're in um, RCA after RCA, um, it's the caregivers are always the first part of that conversation. And so when, when we're looking at the caregivers and we're thinking of, of zero as possible, we had to get that zero as possible thing concept from a nice bumper sticker to where it meets the daily work of each and every team member uh, contributing to the greater goal. Saying zero harm is one thing, but we had to boil that down to not just the caregivers, but each ancillary and support contributor as a foundation uh, to our work. And so when you're in the when you're in the midst of that harm event and you're and you're focused on the caregiver, um, the caregiver is almost always um, an incredibly bright, highly educated, incredibly well trained and licensed professional who has literally answered um, a calling on his or her own life to serve and help others. So how could a harm event have possibly happened, you know, on their watch? Um, why didn't they execute all the elements of the, the pre-transport 
um, fully bundle or mobilize or reposition or why didn't they follow the steps in their process? The common theme that we've all heard in RCA after RCA is time. They were in a hurry. They had another task to get to. They had another patient to get to. And so as we began with the challenge that, you know, Mr. O'Neill challenged us with 15 years ago, Mr. O'Halla challenged us with um, when, when he first arrived at Prisma Health, is let's address that time thing all the way down to the root cause. Let's remove as much of that consistent contributing factor to harm events as humanly possible. Let's push that concept to the theoretical limit, which led us directly to another thing that Mr. O'Neill ingrained in, in the leaders and was also aligned with Mr. O'Halla's vision for the Prisma way to pursue, pursue zero harm. And that was that organizations cannot be compartmentally excellent. They are either pursuing the theoretical limits in everything they do, or they're just not excellent. So we took that challenge from my new boss and from our learnings with Mr. O'Neill. And at Baptist and Park Ridge, we, we took it and we set out to define excellence with pancake syrup. Okay, um, Mike, you had me. You're gonna have to explain pancake syrup. So Is let's that... think about the, the conundrum of time as it, as it links into harm events and, and all of the RCAs that many of us have, have thought through and worked through over the years. If a patient gets a breakfast tray and it has pancakes on it, but it doesn't have syrup, what does the patient do? Oh, right. They push the call bell, right? And then a process failure in tray completeness has become a contributing factor to the caregiver's time issue that's in every single RCA that we've all went through. The nurse is now answering a call light, calling dietary, and delivering pancake syrup. If that nurse loses 10 minutes total because one tray was incomplete, then what other support and ancillary processes are impacting that time factor? What if they never had to look two or three in two or three different Pixis machines before each med pass? What if every supply was where it was supposed to be, was never stocked out in a machine? What if they never waited on patient transport? What if the labs are always on the chart when the doctor's round and the nurse never has to call a physician for a decision that should have been made when the caregiver rounded? How much time could we give back to them? And then how close to the, the theoretical limits could they execute nursing processes in with the time we gave them back? And what impact could that have on qualitative outcomes? If we can simultaneously impact that time factor and have team members prove to themselves on the front line that zero process outliers is really possible in more rudimentary processes, the outcomes would be creating bandwidth for the hands-on patient care staff to do the same with more complex and patient-facing processes. So we set out to train every supervisor and above on the very basic concepts of micro PI for their daily work to build systems with daily real-time measurements that led to organizational transparency and real-time reporting for each function. And it all aligns with the one Prisma tiered safety huddle system that's in place across our company. Okay, Mike, so leaders have to have a powerful vision and a practical one, and you've used pancake syrup to paint that, and you've, you've used the phrase we a lot, and you mentioned training. But this is really a seminar about leadership, and we want to get a little deeper on that. So talk about what you personally did. What were ways you personally showed, I am leading this, I own it, I am not exempt? Yeah, so 10, 10 days into our tenure on the team, um, really, really sent out um, a, a pretty bold challenge to, to both teams on, on both campuses to be, to be relentless in our pursuit. Um, of perfection and process management and process execution, to be transparent um, with each other, with our medical staffs, um, with our communities, um, and, and to be really committed um, to excellence. And so when I, I sent that out, I think I started on the 4th, I sent that out somewhere around Valentine's Day on the 14th, but then we began a vigorous training, um, a vigorous training implementation of of teaching um, micro PI, daily process management, all the way down uh, to the supervisor level. And, and I decided at that point that this is the most important thing that we're doing as a team. So I started every session that I taught personally, I think there was probably 40 or 41 of them, that as your CEO on this campus, I am leading it and I am teaching it. And I'm teaching it every time to everyone because I believe it is the very most important thing that we can do as an organization right now. 
I think that our two teams understanding um, process at the very granular level and you as leaders understanding um, exactly how to impact your core processes each and every day will take us to the next level, not just in quality and in safety, but in all the other pillars that we manage our, our organization by. I would say personally to them, eyeball to eyeball, at the end of this time together, I want you to be able to identify and outline what the ideal state is for your key daily processes, whether you're delivering trays, you're putting labs on the chart, you're stocking a Pixel machine. I, I want you to know what your core fundamental processes are that impact your team members' work. And I want you to be trained to do direct observation of what your existing process is. And then be able to do a simple gap analysis between what you observed as a current process and what you would have identified as ideal. Then we went and started building it. And, you know, Ken, you, you get all the other things, right? We don't have time to do that. I don't have the tools to do that. There's no, you know, we were on a different uh, electronic medical record back then. And so the system wouldn't do that. And we had to eliminate all those excuses. Right. And so we said that we were going to build the clipboards and stopwatches if it, if it took that, if it required that, to begin making meaningful changes in real time. And then we'll fix things one outlier at a time. And we're going to celebrate successes together and share our learning across the organization. So, Mike, you just hit on two more powerful themes we share, and I can hear Paul O'Neill shouting them from the rooftops of leaders take away excuses. It's a fundamental job. There are always excuses. We'll get more to that later. And the other is real time, the power of now, of right now. And, you know, everybody on the call is thinking about leaders that have sent out memos and leaders that have trained, you know, cause good training programs to happen, probably not led 40 of them themselves. Uh, but the rubber really hits the road in the now in the, in the management system. So anything else you want to say about the real-time problem solving and how you support that and the management system reinforcing it to make it real every day? Yeah, thanks, Ken. And so, you know, really aligning our, our daily data collection in and around the processes that each and each and every um, sub-department is executing with the one Prisma safety huddles that are implemented at the campus level, level and led by senior leaders and having at the department, which is the fundamental building block of those cascading safety huddles that happen each and every single day, incorporate their process measurements at the campus level to be able to say, this is how we supported the caregivers from environmental services in bed turn times. This is how we supported the caregivers from a pharmacy with PIXA stockouts yesterday. This is how we supported a campus from the supply chain, from transport, from all of those different um, departments. And it's not okay to just say we performed at 91 or 92 percent. What's really important is that you're able to transparently say these are my six outliers. This is what our supervisors or our, our team members were able to do to make sure that outlier never happens again. Or this is what they escalated um, to me as their leader. And I'm escalating to you, Mike, as my leader, that I need to keep that process variation from occurring again. And then using the, the one system, the one Prisma Health System uh, cascading huddles to share that learning in real time across the organization. And so what that really does to the individual team member is it sets and creates the mindset in their daily work that we're not just going through the motions. When our processes are not producing the, the results, the expectation is we know why, and we take immediate action so that that variation never ever occurs again, or we escalate it to those that can help us get it done. It's, it's not okay to just do PI on a piece of butcher block paper with sticker voting, and we all align ourselves on what we wanna work on next month at the PI meeting. It's about making real-time impact in those processes and in real-time sharing your learning. Exciting, and I hope people are seeing how the pieces are fitting together. And I know I'm getting a feel for what it might like to be like to be one of your direct reports, and the transparency and the questioning, solving the root cause, and keeping those process key metrics and outcomes tight, and the real-time problem solving. So thanks. All right. So now the COVID crisis hits, and we've all experienced it. We have, I'm sure, on the Prisma campus, is massive disruption and worry about safety, of course, but also about finance. So question for you, Mike, is what do you do as a leader to keep the focus on safety? It almost sounds funny to have to say that amidst a COVID crisis, but to keep the focus on safety, including all of the safety that you already embarked upon 
for your teams and your patients um, and keeping that as a precondition during the crisis. Tell us how you manage that. But Ken, on the micro level where the work is truly done with the patient and the caregiver, the real-time process monitoring and daily continuous improvement became even more critical. Any gains that we made in returning transactional time to the bedside have been impacted by the processes around safety for our team members during the pandemic. The appropriate PPE donning and doffing, the checks and balances from the One Prisma Health way of including site managers uh, in and around the COVID patient populations that, that monitored safety precautions and processes in relation to COVID patients all put new demands on caregiver time at the bedside. So now we really, they really didn't have the time to look three different places for medication that had been ordered. They really didn't have time to hunt for a supply or to get pancake syrup. And so really doubling down on the efforts that each individual team member, regardless of your role in the organization, plays to deliver safe and effective care at the bedside during the pandemic was even more critical and important. And additionally, and this is about the leadership portion of your question, in the spirit of habitual excellence, we as leaders had to fight off the easy answer every day. And that easy answer was the one that says, well, our process is outside of its normal control limits, but you know, it's COVID and it's making things a little harder. It was more important than ever that these processes function and that the pursuit of the theoretical limit performance never stopped. You know, Mr. O'Neill, Mr. O'Neill never once said to us, these fundamental concepts only apply when things are easy. Mr. O'Hallis certainly never said that our organization's relentless pursuit of perfection was now paused because people were sick with a new virus. The caregivers didn't feel that way. The patients certainly didn't feel that way. And it was more important than ever to equip our caregivers with more than just PPE and infection prevention protocols. They had to be equipped with time, that time that could come from the relentless pursuit of perfection in all of these subordinate processes that lead into them delivering care. So Mike, really, really powerful to say, you know, it doesn't just apply when things are easy. It, it applies when things are tough, but we've all seen things crumble in different places in our career. So give us one more glimpse sort of inside your gut as you feel the challenges coming and those things you have to fight off. As a leader, what are those decision points? What did that feel like to you, you know, at a time when I'm sure you had a lot to deal with to step up and keep the focus and ultimately rally the troops, if you pardon the expression, to stay on it. Well, what's amazing about the teams um, in, in our two campuses and all across our health company, and I'm sure all across health systems in the nation, is the sense of, of duty that our caregivers felt uh, to our communities. And so really rallying them to the cause of serving the communities wasn't something that I innately had to do on, on the campuses. Or what I had to do is make sure that their passion didn't push them into unsafe conditions, that their desire to serve longer, more people, um, didn't, didn't create the conditions uh, where they could be at risk or where the qualitative outcomes uh, would, would suffer. And so really it was being uh, the check and balance uh, in and around that sense of calling, that amazing sense of pride um, that they had taking care of their communities uh, during, during this pandemic. Thanks. Um, so now we're at a moment where we're coming out of the crisis, hopefully. Uh, people are tired. Uh, people perhaps wanna relax, perhaps some of those habits uh, uh, that might be old habits start to resurface amidst the exhaustion. So how have you and your leader colleagues at Prisma and the Prisma community kept the focus again on excellence and excellence with safety as a precondition and tried to create alignment and energy to support the, you know, what is certainly, I'm sure, a tired community? Well, we've talked a lot about process uh, in the last couple of minutes, but it's, it's really important to understand that people are executing those processes. And Prisma Health recognized the strain, stress, and exhaustion that battling a pandemic for over a year created. So the organization doubled down on their support of team members by creating and offering multi multimodality access to mental health and wellness services 24 by 7. Um, our, our folks are almost to the point where it's like they've redeployed um, from, from an overseas assignment. They, they just, they worked 
uh, relentlessly. And, and it wasn't just the physical strain of, of providing care during this pandemic. Our caregivers became family members for those that couldn't have family members visit. They, they became the loved ones of the patients that were there. They, they watched suffering and sometimes death. And it's taken its toll. So doubling down on the mental health and wellness services was, was really important. And then, and then our boss, Mr. O'Halla, insisted to his leaders, insisted to me, um, that you figure out how you're going to get time away, even if it's just a long weekend. And oh, by the way, you're to ensure your leaders and your team members also get some time away, even if it's for just a long weekend. That too was ultimately about safety because mentally and physically exhausted folks who have gone through you know, a pandemic of a lifetime or longer, um, executing core processes where the end result of the core process is, is a human life, um, really have got to be refreshed, reinvigorated uh, so that they can continue to maintain that focus that, that led them through the pandemic. Thanks, Mike. Um, powerful words. So all of this sounds good, but let's talk about results. So we've gone from you know, uh, pre-pandemic and setting a vigorous course, the crisis and after, you know, through fatigue and what you've just described, what have the results been? What results can you share with us uh, to this moment? Well, I mean, first one is is Prisma wide and Prisma proud. You know, seven of the 10 LeapFrog State and Prisma Health Hospitals are A-rated. Uh, on the Park Ridge campus that was honored with the LeapFrog Top Journal Hospital recognition, um, you know, through the leadership of Dr. Jennifer Reisinger, my diet partner, and all of the team members on the campus and all the members of our campus executive committee and those folks that, that really pursued um, some of these things very specifically on that campus, but overall um, why on the Park Ridge campus, and we had 552 days without a CAUTI, 469 days without a CLABSI. 177 days with no C. diff, 426 days since the colon SSI, 77 days since a hysterectomy SSI, 335 days since a hip SSI, 2,548 days since a knee SSI, 2,548 days uh, since a VAP. But you know what's interesting about these numbers is that since this data set was put together, uh, we had a caught at Park Ridge, and this process never stopped. The team was just as engaged, if not a little enraged, uh, in the pursuit of understanding why down to the root cause. I'm proud of them because just like saying the continued pursuit of the theoretical limits doesn't stop with an external condition gets difficult like a pandemic. It also doesn't stop because you have a solid history. The lazy leadership could say, well, it's just one, right? We, we went a long time without one. Um, I haven't seen an airline commercial yet um, that celebrates the thousandth safe landing. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. It doesn't stop in a way that's, that's the next test. Right. And we, and we keep going. So um, love the theoretic, look, theoretical limits and the problem solving focus and the pride. Um, so let's use that as a bridge to talk a little bit more explicitly about LeapFrog, uh, the LeapFrog survey and the A safety grade and the top hospital award um, and how Prisma used that platform um, to help um, launch the team's uh, thinking and journey. So first, um, could you talk a little bit about the value of that external validation and how you used it in the early stages of the journey um, with your teams? Well, the external validate, validation from such a um, nationally known and recognized and valued partner as LeapFrog um, is incredibly important. It's incredibly important for not just the Park Ridge campus, but for our health company and health companies across the country. At the granular level, uh, it's incredibly important for the campus or any hospital to be able to identify that the work that the team does each and every day in pursuit of process perfection and have an external point of validation so that it furthers individual team members' belief and buy-in to their personal con connection that the role they're executing really does impact um, our qualitative outcomes, that the processes that they're monitoring and modifying in real time, regardless of where it falls uh, in, in their daily work, whether it's at the bedside with an extremely complex uh, clinical task or it's in support of those extremely complex clinical tasks, when they see that work go forward and then all laid on top of it, uh, is, is, is a piece of a very credible external validation. It really does 
validate at the individual team member level if we're doing our job as leaders correctly. Uh, great. So, uh, um, so then you and your team bring a campus to the top, um, to the top hospital designation. And those that got to attend the um, LeapFrog's 20th annual meeting uh, got to see you announcing that to your team via video, and that was uh, moving and exciting. Could you, so could you share a little bit about how that felt to your team, but also an important point you and Missy and I wanted to make here was um, how you reminded them and each other of another fundamental point that we all agree with, which is that the point, the ultimate point of the journey is not the A or the top hospital grade, but the habitual excellence that it's the gateway to. So the award and then the reminder about the journey, share a little bit about that. Well, first of all, the, the team was, was shocked, honored, and, and obviously elated. And, you know, seven of our Prisma hospitals being LeapFrog A-rated, we're very proud of that too. But like any other A-rated hospital in the country, we are in highly complex, process-rich environments where even one infection, one negative outcome is a margin of error we don't accept because at the end of that process is a human being, someone's son, someone's daughter, someone's mom, someone's dad. Um, you, you, you can't just say, well, we are top hospital, top general hospital. We're sorry you got an infection, but we're as good as it gets. That. If you can go to sleep with that kind of mindset in the evening and you're in this chair, you're in the wrong chair. Yeah. 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 Powerful. Never, never ends, right? Um, never. And it can't because we're going to have new challenges tomorrow. We're going to have a new patient tomorrow. And, yeah. and that patient deserves um, the very, very best. The, you know, in, in Mr. O'Halla's words, that, that patient deserves the relentless pursuit of perfection in everything that we do. Uh, regardless of, of where the task falls in the continuum of care. Well, Mike, thanks for uh, engaging in this discussion and sharing so much about the last few years, uh, but the deeper Prisma journey underneath it and your own journey as a leader with your teams and Missy, the critical initial information about the survey. So I know Mark is going to transition us in a structured way to Q&A. Uh, in a minute, I just wanted to observe that Mike's uh, Prisma colleague, Kristen Vondrak, who's the Senior Vice President of Quality, Safety, and Reliability, uh, is on the call together with other Prisma leaders to show Mike support and also uh, can chip in uh, in the chat to answer questions that people may have. And I'm sure in follow-up if uh, folks have, have questions um, on our task. So Mike's the first to say this is a team sport, so it's great to see your team supporting you, Mike, and your colleagues. So Mark, will you transition us to Q&A? Sure. And again, I invite people to continue submitting questions using the Q&A button. It's the best way to help um, submit those. A couple of quick announcements will invite you to check out some additional resources available from both Value Capture and LeapFog Group. Um, to name a few, uh, we have a podcast called Habitual Excellence. The audio of today's webinar will be posted in that podcast series. Normally, every other week, that podcast contains um, interviews with healthcare leaders, um, people from the Value Capture team, and, and elsewhere. So we invite you to check that out and subscribe. You can see upcoming events on our website. Um, there are a number of videos from Mr. O'Neill that you can find um, on our LinkedIn channel. And you can also read uh, transcripts of a number of his speeches in an ebook that we've put together called A Playbook for Habitual Excellence. That's free um, on our website. And then there's another ebook called Lasting Impact, which is a compilation of quotes and reflections from leaders who learned from Mr. O'Neill and were inspired by him. So I'd also invite you to please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And then uh, LeapFrog Group has uh, so many resources available um, as, as Missy uh, kind of just scratched the surface of. You can learn more on their website, leapfroggroup.org. Um, you can find them on Facebook and Twitter. We encourage you to follow them and, and to see what they're sharing. And you can also learn more about the hospital safety grade at hospitalsafetygrade.org. And before we open it up to Q&A, we've got one more announcement that Ken is going to share about. Yeah, thanks, Mark. We're excited about this. Another uh, shared learning program doing in partnership with LeapFrog this fall. So if you like the transformational leadership framework centered on safety, 
um, and your senior leader would like your senior leaders to know more about this and, and want the chance to engage with peers and look at the, the, the framework in a really uh, exciting, dynamic, interactive way. Um, we're putting together a two-day workshop. We hope to do it in person. We'll see. We'll continue to judge the safety progress in Western Pennsylvania in the fall of uh, 2021. Um, it is modeled on um, programs we've done earlier in our history that were really transformative, and we saw um, some of the top most impactful safety leaders in American healthcare sort of change their trajectory coming out and, and add to sustainability. It's really about what leaders have to do and can do to achieve legacies that are really powerful, moving and important that you know last much longer than their own time in the seat of leadership, which at the end of the day is short for all of us. So um, it'll be exciting. Um, we hope you, your senior leaders, top key board members will wanna come. Um, uh, email Helen, as it says on the slide, if you'd like more information or look for um, more information coming out uh, slightly later in the year. Um, but we want you to know that that's coming up. Thanks, Mark. Great, thank you, Ken. And um, again, thanks, Mike and Missy. And uh, we'll look, jump into Q and A here. Um, one, one question for you, Mike. Um, you you um, went through the list of really uh, impressive metrics. Is there a way that you can share that data as a, a follow up with people? Sure. Okay, so we'll figure out, we'll, we'll send that out as part of the follow-up email that, that goes out. Um, there's another question directed to you, Mike. Um, can you please expand a bit on the safety huddle cascade? What's the process from bottom to top? Oh, happy to. And it's a, it's really uh, connects um, an ID in with our scope um, and breadth uh, it, it, to purpose every single day. So, so first thing, uh, early in the morning, there's a campus-wide safety huddle that touches, you know, each and every floor and each and every support department with some very rigorous metrics that we want to talk about. Um, what are the leading indicators? Um, what's the leading indicator to a CAUTI? Well, it's, it's how many Foley's do you have in? Are they all medically necessary? If they're not medically necessary, what's the time frame for getting them out? And going through a very scripted, standardized list of some of our organization-wide qualitative goals at the campus level. And then also at the campus level, you know, you can, you can have those departments uh, report out on their core processes as well, as I described um, earlier. And then those, those are meant to be led by a senior leader uh, from the campus. So oftentimes um, I'll lead those campus level ones. My chief nursing officer for both campuses can do that or another, another member of our senior team. And then there's a an hour or so to really uh, get get your data together, understand uh, any anomalies you had from previous reports, what the follow-up is, and then we'll have a market um, or a system uh, call where sometimes Kristen uh, leads, Dr. Mernack leads, and we'll be able to share any learnings that we had, share any issues that we had, um, and see what mutual support we can provide um, across campuses uh, in, the, in the health company and, and be able to have a, a hardwired um, escalation path uh, for any acute needs that have shown up. And so it's really um, it's really a, a, a great systemic uh, communication tool. Um, and we can focus it in and around those leading indicators uh, to quality and safety. Thanks, Mike. Um, there's another question where uh, both Missy and Mike uh, may have some thoughts here. Um, considering many payers still pay for avoidable errors, do you believe hospitals really have the motivation to make meaningful change? I'll, I'll follow. I'll follow my esteemed panelist. Uh, I'm going to apologize because I have a dog barking in the back. But um, it has been our experience that hospitals are really committed um, to reducing these avoidable errors, and also more and more, I think that both CMS and private payers are looking for opportunities not to pay for these things. Um, there has been some proposed legislation. Um, to actually enforce um, among private insurers some of the CMS no pay parts of their policy, for example. But I mean, I think the important point here is, and Mike's really exemplified this, in hospitals where from the leadership down, there's this culture of safety, the eye is towards the patient. 
um, in making sure the patient gets the best care. Not that the bottom line is not important, uh, but in our experience, the focus really is on the patient um, and keeping the patient safe. But we, we don't hear about you know being disincentivized because people are still paying for them as a reason to not do the work. To be honest, it's it's not incredibly common. I, I, I couldn't agree more. At, at, at the end of the day, um, the, the folks that, that I've had the privilege to serve alongside for the last 20 years in different organizations that have committed their life to helping others, um, I, I never had one of them go, it's okay if they, if, if they get a pressure ulcer because we're going to get paid for the other four days. Um, it truly is about serving people and getting the highest qualitative outcomes for the patient that's in their care that day. And so I, I, I really... And I really think that, you know, as you said, a, a culture like our boss did, who said we're going to relentlessly pursue um, perfection or, or as Mr. O'Neill would say, we're going to pursue the theoretical limit. Um, I, neither of those incredible leaders said comma because we won't get paid if we don't. So uh, I, I agree with with my colleague completely. Right. And we had two similar questions here about the role of your board of directors. What's the role of the board in your culture shift? How are they functioning differently? And then what's the role of the board to help support the processes and the things that you're talking about, Mike? Well, we have, um, we have a corporate board at the prison level that is totally committed to the relentless pursuit of perfection. And it's, it's them uh, working with Mr. Ohala and setting the organizational expectation um, in on our balanced scorecard in all of our performance. Um, evaluations and really looking at how that cascades down through the organization as key priorities um, from the strategic governing board level. At the local facilities, oftentimes we do have some either advisory boards or, or other non-fiduciary boards that are uh, looking after very much their, the communities that they're serving needs. And so very transparent, uh, quali qualitative outcome reporting to those boards and really even pursuing it down further into these sub-processes that we discussed earlier and making that part you know, of, of, a normal, of normal board activity. So we're very, very fortunate that our board um, has the, has the the vision for quality and the passion for safety that, that many of us on this call have. And it makes it very easy to serve uh, in an organization where the very senior, very senior team has, has the same kind of thoughts. Okay, thanks Mike. Um, another attendee asks, what's your take on just culture? Have you incorporated this approach? How would you implement that? Yeah, we, we certainly, um, have taken on the concept of um, everybody owns their process, everybody owns um, their ability to continually improve their process and everybody owns uh, the transparent reporting uh, of when you don't. And, and sometimes, uh, so, sometimes I, I report because I need, I need help. I report because I need, I need to do things. And sometimes there is um, uh, opportunity for uh, human resource intervention, leadership coaching, those kinds of things that have to go in there. But this, the, it's the culture of transparency that, that allows everybody the freedom to report and the freedom to work towards excellence, um, not experiencing that punitive culture, but knowing they'll be held accountable. It's, it's that balance that, that good organizations can find. Another question here, Mike, um, first comment, amazing example of leading um, some much needed culture change. The question, do you have advice for how to engage physicians who are not employed by the hospital in this vitally important culture change? So we, we said when we started that we were going to start as far away from the license as possible, right? We said that we're going to begin uh, proving to ourselves that zero process failures is possible with um, food and nutrition services, environmental services, patient transport, and then we're going to work our way up into the ancillary and support services. We we likened it as to raking our leaves. You can't ask somebody else to rake the leaves in their yard until you've raked your own leaves. And so we're going to rake all the leaves as far away from the license as we can. And then we're going to work our way up to the, to the ancillary work, and then we're going to work our way up to the licensed caregivers. And eventually, when we have all of our leaves raked, you know, we're going to be able to go to our to our medical staff. And I'll get to the question about whether they're employed or not employed in just a second. But it's important, you know, probably in my first week or two weeks, uh, I went and I met, you know, with our hospitalist group uh, on one of the two campuses who, who looked at me and said, 
please don't tell us to come write discharge orders earlier because we'll write our discharge orders earlier and your staff will let the patients stay there all day. Um, and so we had to make sure we raked our leaves at the very granular level before we worked our way up uh, through the licensing channels to the physicians. And then all of a sudden they were like, the sea and leaves getting raked around them and literally went, we're gonna have to get on board because it's coming our way. Um, and then the question very specifically to um, whether or not the physician is part of the integrated delivery uh, health network uh, from an employed status or whether they're in uh, your, your in network or whether they're just a, whether they're an exceptionally aligned private provider. You know, I, I like to say um, I just want to work with people that want to take incredibly good care of other people. And when you connect this to purpose and the purpose is the patient, um, what I've found is that physicians, regardless of where their W-2 comes from, uh, wants to take great care of people. And when you want to align behaviors behind the concepts that Mr. O'Neill used to say, it's one of my favorite Paul O'Neillisms, when you make it an inarguable argument, it doesn't matter whether, whether or not they're employed or where they're at on the license change. It's now an inarguable argument because it's about somebody's safety, their quality outcome, their quality of life going forward. And so, you know, it's not okay to not take exceptional care of people because that's what you signed up to do. And when you put the patient at the focus of it, it becomes a Apollo inarguable argument. Mark? Yeah, um, so Mike makes powerful points. And, you know, for us, it's and Mr. O'Neill is here to respect for each and every individual, right? And physicians are individuals, no matter what they're employed for. And it's the principles and purpose that tie us deeper together. And that brings me to a question from Nelly that I mistakenly uh, indicated was answered because I'm a rookie with this technology. And I just wanted to read it out loud and respond because it's on the same theme. So Nelly says, we have a good process for a safety huddle, similar to describe at the local and system level, but have seen the events not improving and folks are reporting their data, but not owning the data like reporting for reporting and not stopping to recognize the data. So how do we break this cycle and re-engage folks to own the data and reduce? And uh, I know I have thoughts on that, but Mike or Missy, would you like guys like to tackle that? So we got the system, but we're not getting the results. We're sort of checking the boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to make sure the huddle is not transactional. And, and that's where having the leaders engaged in the huddle process uh, is critically important. And setting the expectation that saying, OK, I have 12, um, I have 12 Foley's on the unit today. Well, OK, I can get that out of Epic. Uh, what I want to know is that you've looked to check for the medical necessity and that the report out says that and, and, and that you're telling me how many are coming out because you've looked forward in that. And so it's, it's taking that transactional activity out of your huddle and make it engaging. And, and that's why the leader needs to be engaged and following up from items that were yesterday uh, that were that were highlighted yesterday. So the elevator B was down yesterday. Is the elevator B fixed? Are other people's processes impacted by that? And it can't just be something that you could populate on a spreadsheet and everybody go read. It has to be um, engaging and, and challenging. Um, and, and as it cascades up, that level of engagement and challenge needs to increase. And, and a point I have the temerity to throw in is uh, a lot of people make the mistake of acting like the problem solving happens in the huddles and it does not. And there's, there's capability building around problem solving and it takes the leader engagement and the coaching to recognize where the actual improvement needs to occur. So mm -hmm. um, great, back to you, Mark. That's right. Um, Mike, early on you talked about, you know, this really important challenge of reducing the hurry finding the root cause of the hurry as you illustrated in um, you know, vivid and delicious sounding ways. Um, but when you talk about freeing up time to do the micro PI work, what are some of your strategies, like you said, outside of the huddles, how do we free up time to do improvement that frees up time? Yeah, so that's always the first question when you're teaching the micro PI classes. I don't have time to get a stopwatch and a clipboard and tell you, Mr. Mike, how long it took me to get a dietary tray from the cafeteria to the to, to the to the patient? Uh, and the answer is always, you don't have time not to. Um, if we're not measuring ourselves in, in each one of our core processes, um, then we're not improving our core process, which means you're gonna you're, you're gonna continue to execute the same workarounds forever. Uh, and, and you will continue to be that level of inefficient. Yeah, it, it takes some investment up time. It's some, it is some short-term sacrifice for long-term gain. Um, but you have to remove the excuse of we don't have the systems and we don't have the time to engage in the work. Um, because if those two excuses remain, 
Now, we never get off the ground. Thanks, Mike. I think we might have time for one or two more questions here before we do some final announcements. Um, uh, Mike, um, are, are there strategies Prisma uses related to resilience for the front line and how increased resilience might lead to better safety? Yeah, it, it, you know, not, not just reinvesting in the um, psychological and wellness um, of, of our team members, um, but, but really um, making sure that, that folks are, are, are getting out and, and they're, they're getting time away from the shop mentally and physically. Um, and then secondly, is really monitoring um, what, what is our support while you're on the clock? What are those ratios? What are those key support uh, functions that are there? Um, how, how do we continue to allow you to reinvest in yourself to, to be resilient and be re reinvigorated? Um, it, coming out of this year, uh, this work in this space has, has never been more important. Uh, and those investments could never be uh, more valuable. And, and so I, I think we're going to continue to learn as an organization for, for my shops. And we're going to continue to to put uh, the patient at the center of it all. But knowing that the hands touching the patient uh, also need to be continually reinvested in, into uh, for that level of resiliency. Thanks, Mike. Um, so the question here, do you have words of advice that you, you would have for your peers, other hospital CEOs, other senior executives on how to get started toward theoretical limits? Uh, Ken, that's in your fairway. Um, I, I can just tell you that, you know, when I interviewed for this job, I brought my I brought my binder from 15 years ago that has made the journey with me across a couple of different markets. And I said, I only know this way to do this. And so if, you, if you're in for transparency, daily metrics, open uh, reporting, micro PI. If, if this is something that, that sounds like it's in alignment, I'm your guy. If it doesn't, I'm not your guy because that's all I know. Mm -hmm. So I only know to be excited about it. So I, I don't know, maybe Ken can help how you start a fire um, to, get, to get somebody excited about it because he and Mr. O'Neill Sr. got me excited about it, you know, gosh, 15, 16 years ago. Um, thanks, Mike. So, um, you know, the, the first is, you know, being willing to want to change and head this direction and being curious and interested in leading with safety and truly leading with safety. And some of the leaders that have accomplished the greatest things have talked about not knowing where to go next and realizing that leading with safety was the, was the, was the path that they could follow that would lead to the other paths. And then um, our approach is simple to get started, which is a structured set of experiences and conversations where we go see the current state with really deep eyes, but really simple eyes in a way. Um, and you hear Mike, this is not, Mike has a phrase, we don't want PI for PI's sake or lost in PI. It's, it's about the work of regular people, the outcomes they're getting and the support they need to be able to solve problems and, and move everybody forward and keep everybody safe and be successful in their work. And we do a set of structured experiences to just help see that framework and then leaders being willing to help put a strategy together around to, to go deeper in that direction and you can build these structures around it anchored in purpose and simple, powerful, people-focused leading with safety. And um, the intention is all you need. And then the steps to begin accelerating your journey are easily within reach. Well, thank you, Ken. And I, in the spirit of you know, continuing that conversation, if anybody in the audience um, has further questions or wants to have conversations about any of these topics, you can contact um, Ken or myself or Helen Zach from our value capture team. Um, ag again, as a couple final uh, points, the recording of this will be shared and emailed um, out to all of you tomorrow. We encourage you to share that with um, colleagues. You may wanna sit and watch it together and have your own discussion and reflections on it. And when the session ends, um, you'll be prompted to fill out a survey um, we, we do really value your thoughts and feedback. This is our first webinar. We would love to hear your thoughts about what went well, um, what we can improve upon, if you have ideas for future webinars, and if you have any follow-up questions, you can submit that through um, that form. So uh, on behalf of the entire team at Value Capture, again, I wanna thank Mike Bundy, Missy Danforth uh, for joining us and sharing your perspectives. Thank you for the important work that you and your organizations are doing. And I also wanna thank uh, Ken Siegel, CEO of Value Capture. Um, so we're at the top of the hour, so I think we'll, we'll um, 
I have to call an end to this, but really enjoyed the hour together. Thanks for everything you all shared. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Missy. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure.